You know, this is the time of year where everybody kind of gets in a panic. Uh, school's about to start, and what we plan to do during the summer, you know, we're down to just a few days that are available. So, uh, for that reason, we've got a bunch of families that are missing this morning that are scurrying to get that last celebration, relaxation, uh, vacation, whatever you want to call it, trying to get that all wrapped up and done for the for the summertime. But thank you for being here this morning with us. We appreciate you, and I hope you enjoy praising the Lord with us this morning.
Good morning. So I, before I start into uh, the message on communion, I thought I would just share a little bit from uh, what's been going on in my life as we have our, our speakers for the day are, are not available to be with us. But most of you know that about a year ago, uh, I retired from my work at Confluence Health. And it has been a great year. i got to tell you, it has, been, it has been everything I had hoped it would be and then some. God is so good. Um, but over the last probably five or six months, I've thought, what is next? What does God have for me? And recently, as I've talked with my wife, um, an opportunity came up to be considered for a position with Samaritan's Purse. Most of you know Samaritan's Purse for the Operation Christmas Child or you know, Christmas Shoebox, as it's often called. So Samaritan's Purse does a lot of different things. And they currently have people serving in over a hundred different countries throughout the world doing disaster relief. So I applied for and have been hired to be part of a disaster assistance response team that serves uh, for international disasters. So, for example, the latest team that they sent out went to Grenada, a small country in the Caribbean, where Hurricane Debbie went through. So I'll be part of a 13-man crew that will fly into a disaster area and will help establish a foothold, and then from there, supplies and resources will be funneled in from across the world and working with churches and some of the government agencies to meet the needs of the people there. And the neat thing is, yes, we are meeting some of their, their basic needs, food, shelter, clean drinking water in particular, but that's the vehicle through which the gospel gets to be shared. So I'm super excited that, that I get to be able to help people in their time of need, but more so that, uh, that I get to be part of a team that shares Christ with, with the world. So I expect to be going on deployments probably two to three times a year. And those deployments will be roughly a month long. So I don't know when they will be or where they will be. That's up to the Lord. But I thought I would share that with you because I need something from you. And the position that I'm, I'm taking has a small stipend that allows me to, to get paid when I'm deployed. So I don't need money, which is, which is a huge risk. What I do need, though, are your prayers. Um, this is new for me. It's something that is probably going to be a little bit outside of, of my comfort zone. Um, you know, the sleeping in tents and, you know, being in austere environments, not so much, but the work and the missions work in particular will be a challenge. So I'm looking forward to it, but I would ask that you would uh, pray for me, uh, especially when I'm deployed, that uh, not only would there be safety, but more, more importantly, that there would be opportunities to share Christ. Something you got, Mike? Yes. Let's pray right now. I'll pray you why don't we do that. Lord, we are thankful that you have a call on each of our lives, and you revealed part of that call to Tom now. And so, Lord, we do lift him up in prayer now, as well as when his deployment comes, we'll make a commitment to that. When he goes to pray for his effectiveness, his safety, and that he can be a light for Christ. Thank you for calling him and providing him and showing him what you want him to do. And we pray that you would be a blessing to many others through what you've called him to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. In 1614, Doug, I think you were the only one around then. Um, <laughs> a gentleman named Nicholas Herman was born in France. Nicholas Herman later went by the name of Brother Lawrence. He grew up in extreme poverty, and at the age of 16, he joined the army because he knew he could get food, and they also were able to pay a little bit of money. He entered the army at a time when France was in what was called the 30-year war. Uh, most Americans don't know what that is uh, from world history. It's, it was small and uh, fairly uh, contained to that region, but it was horrible. He saw horrendous things. He was wounded multiple times. Um, 
And after the, after the war, at 26, he decided he was going to enter the Lord's service. And he entered what was called a priory in order to become a monk. And it took him about a year to do that. And he had some lowly jobs. His first job was as a, a kitchen cook, where they would feed the people in Paris through a soup kitchen type of environment. But because of his injuries, he wasn't able to stand and to carry the heavy loads that cooks had to do. So they made him uh, a job where he would repair sandals for people, which is a pretty low job. But his influence started to grow regardless of the position that he was in. And people started to come and seek guidance from him. And it was because he had a reputation for profound peace and for wisdom. And the wisdom that he passed on to people was actually recorded by one of the, the church secretaries. And conversations and the letters that he sent were actually published in a book after he passed away. The book was called The Practice of the Presence of God. I don't know if any of you have read that. I have not. But it is now on my list. Um, but this, this brother Lawrence, as he's known, developed a spiritual exercise that challenges us to remain focused on God during everyday tasks and chores. Now, Mike recently challenged us to spend time showing God that we love him. And one of the ways is to spend time with him and to tell him that we love him. And you guys may not know this, but Mike occasionally talks about reading through your Bible in a year. Every once in a while you hear him talk about that. But again, it's spending time with God. Last night, we have the grandkids, and last night we were singing a song. Some of you know it, I'm sure. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. So part of the reason we read our Bibles is to, number one, is to learn, learn God's word, learn the commands that he has for us. But it's also a great reminder because in there, it tells us that he loves us. And as believers, we love Jesus. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus' words at the Last Supper are given to us. And they're in the Gospels, but Matthew 26 in particular is the one that I'll be sharing from today. So we come together in communion to remember what Christ did for us. His sacrifice, the shedding of his blood. In the Old Testament, the blood covered the sin. The New Covenant, Christ's blood removes the sin. And so we get to celebrate that. But as I think about Brother Lawrence and his message, how much better would it be if as we go throughout our day, whether it's mowing the yard or whether it's cooking dinner, reading a book, whatever it might be that we're doing, are we practicing, or how much better would it be if we were practicing God's presence in our life? If you're a believer in Christ, he resides within us. You know, we wouldn't be, when we get saved, we talk about, you know, inviting Christ into our heart. And that's a, a concept that as Christians we understand, the world maybe not so much. So, we may go throughout our, our day and not think about Christ, not think about the Holy Spirit, but He is with us every step of the way. He sees everything we do, hears everything we say, knows what we're thinking. So how much better would it be for us if we truly practice the presence of God in those daily uh, chores and tasks that we have to do? It might keep us from saying some things we shouldn't or doing some things we shouldn't. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing at all. So, in Corinthians, Paul also gives us instructions on how um, and how to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And what are we remembering? So, as we look in in Isaiah fifty-three, verses four through seven, is where we'll start. Here we go. 
Truly he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, and he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he was so he opened not his mouth. It tells us what Christ was going to suffer, and he did. So as we look at Paul's instructions in Corinthians, he tells us that this is a celebration for believers. And if, if you are with us today and you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, we would ask that as the elements, the bread, and the juice come by, that you just let them pass by. He also calls us to examine our hearts. Do we have anything in our life that we need to confess? Are there things that we are doing that we should be doing? Our relationship with others, are they in a, in a spot where when we speak to them, they see Christ? And that's a little bit harder because that requires a little bit more self-examination and maybe a little honesty. So I would ask that before we begin today, that we just spend a minute in prayer, quietly, asking, asking God to reveal to us if there's anything in our lives or in our hearts that are keeping us from our right relationship with Him. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this bread that we're about to take. Uh, we thank you for uh, being willing to sacrifice your body, Lord, to be tortured uh, and to be put on a cross because of our sin. And that you did it willingly, Lord. We are so thankful. And as we take this bread today, may we remember the sacrifice you made for us. In Christ's name.
1 Corinthians 11.23 For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Would you bless the cup?
in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 27. Paul gives instructions as it relates to the cup. And he says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's pray. Mike is going to end his message today with some homework. Is that accurate, Mike? Yes, sir. Okay. So... You're going to have some, some homework here, too. So you actually have two assignments for next week. Is that okay? Can we do that? And I want you to think about practicing the presence of God in all you do. So as you go throughout your week, think back to today and think about, God is with me everywhere I go. And what can I do to practice his presence? How do I talk to God throughout the day in everything I'm doing? So that's your challenge for the week. You don't have to read anything. Thank you. Would you like to stand, please? We'll sing this song together.
Easter, hallelujah. As the worship team is dismissing, we're going to pray for our children and children's church, and we'll let them go as well. Father, we're thankful for uh, the goodness that you've given to us through your son, Jesus, and how we celebrate what he has done for us. We're also thankful, Lord, for these children that you place in our families and in our church. And I pray as they're excused now to go to children's church, you'll open their hearts to the things from your word that they need to hear and know. Give our teachers wisdom and sensitivity as they lead these little ones to a deeper understanding of who you are so that Jesus might be their Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As the children are dismissing, you can go now, kiddos. With the rest of you, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're working our way through the book of Hebrews. Each, each week, we kind of just take a little chunk and work our way forward. The book of Hebrews is divided into three uh, parts, or three segments, and right now we're in that third part, the superiority of the Christian walk, and that itself is divided into a number of parts, a call to full assurance of faith, that's that first part, then a call to endurance of faith, a call to love from our faith, and a call to endurance in faith. And that's really kind of where we go in our walk with him. This begins the final section of the book of Hebrews. The entire theme of the whole book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ in the new covenant over the law of the old covenant. This last section is about the application of the first two. Christ is superior in this section and is an application of his superiority, living it out in our life. Not that we're superior. Oh, that we serve a superior high priest. Thus, the superiority of the Christian walk. Each section, each of these sections is a call to each one of us. A call to full assurance of faith. A call to endurance of faith. A call to to love from our faith, and a call to continue in faith. Now that first section is a foundation to, to all the rest. Without a full assurance of our faith, <laughs> the rest would be a little bit shaky and rather inconsistent. So the, the study for today helps us examine the practical steps by which we can cultivate that full assurance. It brings us to an interesting note it's a bit of a challenge. Many people understand the word faith as something that you believe. And that is true, but that's not completely all of it. I have faith that things are going to work out for the better. But in a biblical sense, faith is much more than what you believe. The critical part is what you do with what you believe. Therefore, faith is what you believe and what you do with it. I have absolute faith that we should drive 60 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour zone. I have a confession to make because my wife is in the room and she knows that I violated that by five miles an hour today. There was a person in front of me that was going much slower and I had to slow down and I felt this thing on my arm and she was going, That's her way of calming me down a little. Now, guys, when your wife does that to you, does that calm you down or does that fire things up a little bit? I'll let you take it as you want. It's meant to calm you down. But faith is what you believe and what you do. Otherwise, it's just mental stuff. It isn't life-giving faith. And so as we take a look at this first section, this call to full assurance of faith, there are several, there's an exhortation to faith, and then there's a warning that we, we have five warnings in the book of Hebrews. This is the fourth warning. 
the danger of drawing back, and we'll talk more about that when we get there. Then there's an explanation of faith as we jump into uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Then there is a vast list of examples of faith, and we'll get to those as we go along. But this exhortation to faith, that's kind of where we are today. So I'd like us to start with this. You have your sermon notes printed in the bulletin. Don't forget to turn it upside down when you get there, and you'll be able to follow along in your sermon notes. So the first point is about confidence in faith. And it takes us through Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Let me read that for you, please. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a, heart, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. If we were to take just that section alone and preach for the next three or four weeks, we still wouldn't be able to drain that dry. Therefore, brothers, he says, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, this takes a little bit of explanation and backstory that's there. The writer of Hebrews, as we've talked about before, is taking the, the people that were of Jewish faith the people that had grown up with the first covenant, we call it the Old Testament, but they'd grown up with the first covenant. They'd lived by the law. They'd seen the sacrificial system, the Levitical system. And to us, it just seems so confusing and almost overwhelming. But they had practiced and lived by that. And there was embedded in all of these laws, all of these practices, something that kept pointing forward and kept pointing forward. And I appreciate some of the words, specifically some of the words that Tom used this morning, that in the Old Covenant, the blood of the sacrifice covered the sin so that God could forgive and love. But in the New Covenant, our sins are no longer covered. By the blood of Christ, they're taken away. The sins are gone. They're not just covered over. But all those sins from the Old Covenant were covered over and just kind of like a gigantic snowball moved forward. And then when Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins, His blood covered, not just covered, but totally forgave and removed them. And God remembers them no more. There's a confidence in that. And so it says in verse 1, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. This holy places is the actual presence of God under the first covenant. For someone to, to look up and say, oh God, was almost a horrifying experience because they're trying to come before a holy God without a priest. And they had priests in those days, and the priest was to stand as the goal between, between God and mankind. And if I needed to send something, a message to God, that I would go to the priest and they would say, God, would you, I mean, would you help take this by request to God? And the priest would go before God and do that, and God would answer back, and they would have this thing. But in the New Testament, Jesus is our high priest, and we go directly to him. Not because I'm so great and, and I'm so pure. In my flesh, I'm not pure. But in the spirit, because of the blood of Christ, he sees Jesus' blood that has purified me. And I can come directly into the holy places because of the blood of Christ. It says in verse 20, by a new and living way, that he has opened to us through the curtain that is through his flesh. We talked a while back that when there was this, this, this gigantic multi-layer curtain that separated the holy place that only the priest could go into in the tabernacle or temple. And then the, the most holy places where the, the mercy seat and, and, and was that, that God's presence, presence would reside. Now he wasn't limited to that, but that was the most holy place. It was a picture of heaven. Scripture says that when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. Nobody down in the bottom with a pair of scissors dipping it away to try to tear it open. It was ripped in two from heaven to earth. God opened up the door and allowed us to come in because Christ paid the way through the curtain, his own flesh, 
verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now that word confidence, right up there in verse 19, it's, it's translated boldness in the King James, the New King James, other versions use a different word. The Greek word is parousia, and it literally means frankness or bluntness or without hesitation. And you know some people who talk like that. There is no filter between their brain and their mouth. You know somebody like that. Don't raise hands and don't point fingers. But here God says, you don't need to have an excuse not to come before me. God says, I want you to come before me with the confidence, not on your own merit, but with the confidence that when Jesus shed his blood, it was absolutely, totally sufficient. That your unrighteousness, my unrighteousness, your sinfulness, my sinfulness, has been completely dealt with. And the judgment that was due to me for my gross imperfection, Jesus took that as he suffered on the cross. And now that's completely and absolutely satisfied. And I can come before God with boldness and confidence because he's told me to. It comes with the understanding of confident assurance. Here's some other places that that, that, that word parousia is used in the New Testament. When Peter and John in the book of Acts chapter 4 were released from prison, they were going to be killed, but they got released. And it says, and now... Lord, look upon the threats of the other people and grant that your servants, Peter and John, might continue to speak your word with all boldness, parousia, which is the Greek word there, meaning confidence and boldness. They weren't so impressed with how good of orators they were. They weren't so impressed with what mighty power they might have exuded on their own. But they were absolutely impressed with God's sufficiency, God's indwelling power to work through them to other people. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, it speaks about Jesus Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith. So we, any one of us can come before God at any time. In fact, many times, and this is not meant to be a dig or a put down, but we almost have a habit of praying at the end of our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we all do that, and that's okay, but don't lose the significance of what that means. Lord, I know that I am unworthy and incapable of approaching your throne on my own merit or even worthiness without the name of Christ, without his intervention, without his priesthood on my behalf. It might be more fitting to start our prayer Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray. And then we pray the prayer, and when we're done, the word amen does not, is not a Greek way of saying, oh, uh, check it out, uh, see you later, uh, be a fan. What does be a fan mean? Bye for now. It's, it's not a way of just saying, okay, we're doing that. When we say amen, it means so be it. May it be done. It's, a, it's an affirmation of what was just said. So you're not just saying, be offended God, when you say amen. It's sort of like, Lord, I'm here with you all the time. But in Ephesians 3.12, we have boldness and confidence through our faith in him. And then in 1 John 5.14, uh, uh, John tells us, and this is the confidence, this is the parousia, this is the boldness that we have toward him. Now catch this, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that we have the request, which is that some God. Confidence. So let me ask the question. What's the difference between confidence and arrogance? You ever thought about that? I asked Marilyn that, and we really wrestled with that this week. The difference. What makes the difference between confidence and arrogance? What makes you think you can just march right into the holy places with a, with a priest of the old, that the old had, and they, when they were so meticulously careful. Well, here's the difference. Confidence is recognizing that God has made the means and the ability possible by his sovereign choice. He's got this. 
Now we can live our life that way, regardless of whether you're in business, whether you're going to school, that you're in your marriage, your neighborhood, a ministry project, like Tom's going with Samaritan at first. He can go there with confidence. Not because he's so high and mighty all great. He can go there recognizing that God has made the means and ability possible by his sovereign choice. He's got this. On the flip side of that, arrogance means taking the credit and trusting in yourself. I got this. It, 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 it may look the same on the outside, someone that's got confidence or arrogance, but they're worlds apart. Confidence says, he's got this, and I'm moving forward with boldness. Arrogance says, I got this. I'm going to move forward, and I don't care who's in my way. There's a fine line difference. And many times it might look the same on the outside. God knows the difference on the inside. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that's our confidence of faith. Point number two in your outline is a confession of faith. We're just going to look at verse 23 for this one. The, the writer of Hebrews, he's writing to these people that are, are struggling with making that jump to trusting in Christ alone rather than their adherence to all of the regulations of the law. They really were devoted to the Lord. And all they've ever known is all the regulations from the first covenant. And now they're being told that trust in Christ alone with your faith alone. And that's what God really desires. And that was a struggle for them. What also was a struggle, there's these Gentiles, these non-Jews. They knew nothing about the law. They never kept any of the commandments. They didn't know squat about anything to do with commandment 1 through 10 or any of the Levitical priests and all this. And all they do is they come and they say, you know, I heard about Jesus that he died for my sins. And I asked him to come into my heart. And now I'm brand new and I want to join your church. And these Jews are because they saying, wait a minute, there's a lot you got to learn, buddy. And so there was this conflict in the church in those days. And the writer of Hebrews says, you don't have to pick which one's right. The answer is yes. If you have that heritage as a Jew, Christ is a fulfillment of everything that you've been studying your entire life. And if you come as a Gentile, Christ is a fulfillment of everything you've been missing in your life. And now we come together claiming Jesus as Messiah as our high priest. And it says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So what is it that we're called to do in this verse? Well, there's a number of things. Number one, hold fast the confession of our hope. Now, boy, that's a lot of Bible words that I don't know how that meets my shoe leather in today's life. Well, when times get challenging, dare to trust or lean on God like you never have before. Whether it's a financial uh, situation, a job situation, a family crisis, a uh, uh, weather crisis, anything that comes up, when things get incredibly challenging, dare to trust God and lean on Him. There was a time at, at, earlier in my ministry when I was involved with, with the church and I really loved that church and there was an issue of theology that came up that split that church right down the middle. And it was on an issue of salvation. And so it wasn't a peripheral issue, it was at the core. And one group of the church which was growing believed that salvation could be engendered this way and another group of people thought that it needed to go this way, and there was elements of truth on both sides, but they wouldn't listen to each other, and they argued with each other, and it was just whipping that church right down the middle. And they looked at me and said, okay, pastor, which side are you on? I wanted to say, well, I'm on God's side. You're both wrong. But that's not how it works. And so my soul was wrecked. And I remember multiple times I was on my knees in my office praying, God, I need wisdom. Help me to have wisdom. And I cannot tell you. I cannot remember the specifics. And, and maybe he's caught in my, my memory a little bit on purpose for this. I can't remember exactly what happened to mend that, but it was mended. 
And I just basically cried out to God. I, I leaned on him. I trusted in him in a time that was challenging. And he did all the work behind the scenes. There were a few families that left our church on either side of that. But God began to knit and to mend that church family back together to be strong and healthy and vibrant and growing. So when, in, when you get in, in times of challenge, dare to trust God and lean on him. On the other side of that same coin, when times are great, Things are going really smooth. There isn't a ripple on the sea. There's not a cloud in the sky. Dare to enjoy the blesser more than the blessing. Keep your eyes on him. Oh, God, thank you. Remember that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the continuation of this blessing. But make sure you're focusing on the blesser. Not just soaking up the blessing. Yes, he does want us to enjoy the blessing. But don't let the good times dilute your attention. Don't let the bad times distract your attention. Hold fast the confession of your hope. That's the first part of that. Now it says without wavering. That it has a sense of being firm but without vacillation. Now, I can stand here today and say, yes, I believe God's word. I believe it's true. I trust God. Have you ever come to a point in your life where you got nervous and anxious and kind of agitated over stuff? Well, if I come back to what I was saying on Sunday, yep, I trust God. Never failed me yet. And in the week I get good. Really. Well, those both can't be true. So I need to come back. I need to quit vacillating back and forth. I need to come to God and say, God, right now, my heart is buzzed up like a mainspring here. I need your help to unwind and to keep my focus on you without wavering. I want to find your place and drive my stake in the ground. But the first couple of words in the text, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us, it's us, it's us. We need each other. Let us, we do this together. We encourage one another. We challenge one another. We need each other in the process. And so there'll be times where God has given you a, a, a blessed day. You're, you're confident. You have the sense of his boldness. You've read his word that day. You've seen some interesting things in there. And God puts you in contact with somebody who's not. Now, it's not for you to walk up to that person, they're there now. I got this. You need to get it too. That's not the process. We come alongside each other. We help each other. We do this together. We pray together. Maybe sometimes we need to read the Word of God together. We encourage one another. And yet, we also challenge one another. Tom, I appreciated your challenge for us to do what you wanted us to do. I wrote that down on my notes. Because what I already had set out as homework just is slice almost the same thing with different words. So you and I must be talking to the same person. Wow. <laughs> Challenge one another. But on what basis can we do any of this? He who promised is faithful. Now you think of any challenge in your life, whether it's an employment challenge, a health challenge, a financial challenge, a family challenge, a neighborhood challenge, any challenge you have that you're facing right now. Is God still faithful? I need a yes or a no. Okay, four of you said he is. Did I, did I get anybody else signing on with me on that one? Okay, three more. Is God still faithful? Yes. All right, good deal. The rest of you didn't answer, you need to. He is still faithful. He can get us through that. He will be there, not just at the other end waiting for us, but walking through it with us. He is that. So how is, how, how, how is this done? Well, that's where point number three comes in. There's a consideration of faith. In verse 24, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And that word stir up, 
as the older brother and my younger sister growing up, I used to think it take great delight in stirring up my sister. That's not what this is talking about, people. And you know, you those of you who are older siblings, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, there were some times where my sister Judy would know how to stir me up too. So if you're a younger sibling, that's not what we're talking about either. But, but let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So we're called to, first of all, consider, contemplate, deliberate, think about what fits them the best. As, as we walk our Christian walk, we're not walking as an island by ourselves. We're walking together as a church family. We need each other. And part of this is to consider. Now some of the times, not a lot of things come to me just on spur of the moment. Where I got these one-liners, man, I can just whip them off like that. That doesn't happen with me. I have to, behind the scenes, think things through. And what would I say in any given situation? Some people that have that, that gift of quick wit, uh, I admire, but I, I can't do that. So I have planned out ahead of time. And I'll give you an example of how that situation worked for me. So I won't, I have here a pen. And I was telling, I think Ron, I told this earlier too today. Um, a hobby that God has given me is that I can make uh, ballpoint pens and pencils out of wood and then put the hardware in it. And that's a kind of a cool looking little pen. Uh, and, I, and Marilyn and I go to a farmer's market up in Manson and we sell our stuff up there. Now, this is not an advertisement. I'm trying to get there somewhere. So here's the deal. I found a piece of driftwood on the shores of Lake Chelan a while back. And who likes driftwood? They get in, they break your prop on your boat if you're out on the lake. They get under your dock, they cause a big mess. The locals don't like driftwood. But I found this stick down there, and I thought, there's got to be a pin in there somewhere. So I took it home and turned it on my leg, and it was almost pure white, almost as white as the paper that was there. And as I was chiseling away, <coughs> a big chunk of it flew out. Ah. So I got some epoxy, and I fit it back in there and dried it and planed that down. And out came a pin that was kind of cool looking on the other end. Now, it wasn't me. God's the one that came up with all of this stuff. So at the market, we're, we're at there yesterday. And some, some guy walks up and says, what do you got that's interesting? Ah, I got a piece of driftwood. Driftwood? What are you talking about? Driftwood? How is that interesting? So I explained to him. I said, this is the story of my life. I was a reject. I was drifting. Nobody wanted me. And God got a hold of me. And believe me, he has, he has had his chisel on me for a long time, taking away all the junk that he doesn't want there. And when I have a major flaw in my life, he fills it with the epoxy of the Holy Spirit and he molds and shapes that. And someday, I'm hoping to be just as functional as this pen. Whoa, can I buy that? Well, as a matter of fact, it is for sale. You can do that. But the point is, we can have a story even if it's out of a stick. And I didn't think of that on spur of the moment. I'm not good like that. I thought about this well in advance. As I'm turning this thing on my leg, I'm thinking, oh man, what a disaster this is going to be. And, I, and God and I have a lot of conversations doing this. And he was convinced me this is going to work, right? Just work with it. As long as you tell the story. And so I was being obedient to him when I did that. But it says, consider, you have to think about it in advance. Consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. And this word stir up, <laughs> it literally means to agitate, motivate, and stimulate. But it really what fits them best. It, 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 there is a point where we need to kind of help people along and stimulate them to love and good deeds. My job is not just to stimulate somebody because it's fun to watch them get agitated. We don't want to just watch the worm score on here. But it's the idea, what can I do to help motivate this person, stimulate them to love and good deeds? Because we really do need each other. Number four, and we'll wrap this up. There's a continuation in faith. Verse 25. And we're to not neglecting to meet together 
as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This was a verse that God really drilled into my head during COVID. During COVID, the rule was shut it down. Shut down businesses, shut down schools, shut down churches. You can't be together. Don't be neglecting to meet together. Well, God gave us an idea through Sal, my brother-in-law. We got a little FM transmitter, stuck it out in the parking lot. Y'all showed up in the parking lot. We stood up, the worship team stood up here in the bank. Those of you who were new, you, uh, were here during COVID, you can remember those days. We, we sat up there and we put the speakers up, tuned your radio to 89.1, clicked. And there you go, you could listen to the sermon in your pajamas with a cup of coffee and a bagel. And anybody want to say amen? What did they do? Um, um, they honked the horn. That was cool. So anybody out, if you want to say amen today, you can say amen, or you can just give me a big honk and we're good with that. But we're not to neglect meeting with each other. Now, to not neglect, it means to leave behind, to degrade in priority, to be left over. It's easy to do that now. Oh, we don't need to go to church. We, we don't need to go to, I mean, my salvation isn't hinged upon whether I go to church today or not. That's true. A lot of people who don't go to church but still have faith in Jesus are going to go to heaven. But he says in Scripture, don't, don't neglect meeting together. Why? Because we need each other. Don't, just, don't neglect meeting together as is the habit of some. Some people say, you know what? I'm just going to take a day of rest and I'm going to sleep in. I'm staying home. That's my habit. And the, 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 the writer of Hebrews says, no, no, no. Make it a time where you can meet together. Don't neglect that time. Don't leave it as a leftover. Meet together and encourage one another. The word encourage, the Greek word is parakaleo, and it means to be called alongside, to come alongside, to pray with, to give counsel, to listen to, to remind each other of God's goodness. Doug Millar and his wife Ann was walking in today, and I didn't get a chance to greet him, but Doug says, how you doing? What did I say? I was doing okay until the Millars walked in. Now I'm doing great. And that's true. But you can tell that to other people and encourage one another. Let them know that they make a difference in your life, a positive difference in your life. But listen to people. Sometimes just listening can be a huge encouragement. Parakaleo means to be called alongside. To help us in the continuation of our faith. So there's a confidence of faith, a confession of faith, consideration of faith, and a continuation of faith. And that's what God has called us to do. Now Tom told you about the homework that we're going to have. So those of you who are visiting, we always have a take it home section at the end of each of our, of our messages. And Tom said, practice the presence of God. I'm just going to simply say, draw near to Him. I'm going to take it a step farther in just a moment. But use this time this week, draw near to Him. Spend a little time in, in prayer if you haven't done that normally. Uh, spend a little bit of time Praying for one another in the church body. <clears throat> Draw near to him. Look for ways to remind yourself when you're driving. Uh, maybe if you're at work and you're, you're, it's, it's such mental focus to really hammer down in your brain on stuff that you're doing that you don't think about God for several days. That's not necessarily sinful, but what can I do to stimulate my brain? Put a little reminder on your phone. Pray. Or God or something, oh yeah, and you, you spend just a few, 15 seconds, Lord, just help me get my brain turned back around to let you be a part of my day. And then you go on with the rest of your day. But look for ways to draw near to Him. And then secondly, right alongside that, draw near to each other. That can be text messages, a phone call, a visit, go out to, out to lunch or dinner or breakfast, or just snagging them after church sometime or meeting them in the parking lot. But draw near to each other. Look for ways to encourage one another. Look for ways in which you can pray with or challenge people to a higher level. We all need to be tra challenged to the next level. And it's not as though I'm putting somebody down because they aren't up to my level. No, let's both move to a higher level. That's what we're talking about. 
So that's our practice, uh, is to, you can call it practicing the presence of God. I just divided it into two parts. Draw near to Him and draw near to each other. And then ponder, next week, ponder Galatians chapter 1. Read Galatians chapter 1 every day. That helps us put our, our framework together for what the, the, the people in the writer of Hebrews day were, were facing some of the things that the people were in Galatia when Paul wrote that letter to them. So look at Galatians chapter 1 each day this week and allow God to bless you in the process. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we're thankful for your word. There's such plain instruction right there. And we really do need each other. Lord, I thank you for that reminder. I pray you'll help us to see creative ways in which we can uh, touch the lives of other people just simply by an act of obedience of following you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the encouragement it gives. And thank you for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you like to stand, please? <laughs>